Hello, I'm Reverend Scott Whipperman, pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Helena, Montana, and we welcome you to our worship service today. I'd like you to know that regardless of who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, you're welcome here at First Presbyterian Church. Our epistle reading today comes from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth that he helped found. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Cleo's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Cryptus and Gaius. No one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom and elegance, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And from Matthew, the fourth chapter, shortly after Jesus has been baptized and off in the wilderness and now is back when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went to live in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zelbum and Naphtha, and to, fill, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The word of the Lord. Well, Ray was a child of the 60s. <clears throat> he grew up in a big city. And as a teenager, he had a big fight with his father and went as far away to college as he could out in Berkeley, where he was somewhat of a hippie. <laughs> he fell in love and married a woman from Iowa, and they moved back to Iowa. And she talked him into buying a farm and becoming a 
farmer. So here he is in his mid-30s, standing out in the middle of his crop of corn, examining the plants, walking down the rows between all the corn. And he hears a voice. <coughs> Build it, and he will come. And he hears the voice again. Build it, and he will come. Yes, this is the movie Field of Dreams. 1989. He hears this voice. But build what? And for who? And he tells his wife, who thinks he's only mildly crazy. But the next day, he's out on the field again and he hears the voice, build it and he will come. And looking back at the house, he sees a light. He sees a vision of a baseball field there next to the farmhouse with lights with a backdrop, backstop, and with a very small set of bleachers on one side. He builds the field. Much to the wonderment of his neighbors who can't understand why he's plowing in part of his crops. He builds the field. They've wrecked the lights. They lay down the sod, they put the stripes and the bases out there. And the summer comes, and the summer goes, and the harvest comes, and the fall winds blow, and snow settles over the baseball field in the winter. And the next spring rises, and the corn begins to sprout up. But nothing has happened. And Ray and his wife Anne are sitting at the dining room table going over the finances and with the reduced acreage because they've taken out some of the farmland for this baseball field, she figures that at best they'll fall short of breaking even. And they're talking about the finances. <clears throat> and their daughter, Karen, keeps trying to interrupt. And finally she gets her word in and says, Daddy, there's a man standing on your lawn. And Ray and Ann look out the window, and yes, there's someone standing out there on the baseball field wearing a baseball uniform. And Ray goes out, and it's shoeless show Joe Jackson there on the baseball field. Build it, and he will come. And they play ball for a while, hitting the ball to r and pitching. And then Ray and Shoeless Joe talk, and Shoeless Joe finally leaves, walking out into the outfield, surrounded by the corn, and just kind of fades into the corn as he walks away. And the next day, Shoeless Joe is back. <clears throat> and he says, You know, there are eight others. You remember the story. Shoeless Joe and eight others were accused of throwing the World Series. And the argument is, is that Shoeless Joe did take the money but he did nothing to throw the series. He had the only home run in the series. He had the highest batting average, 375 in the series. He made no errors in the outfield. But all eight, Shoeless Joe and the other eight, were all banished, suspended from baseball. And so Shoeless Joe says, you know there's others. Can they come too? And Ray says, sure. I built this field for you. And so they come, and whenever they leave, they all go out and fade into the corn at the edge of the field.
But then Ray hears another voice. Ease his pain. Whose pain? What pain? And eventually he comes to the conclusion that he has to go find Terence Mann, a famous author of the 60s who coined the phrase, make love not war, who wrote about peace and love and kindness in a time of great turbulence and upset. And he's convinced that he has to go find Terence Mann and take him to a baseball game and that something's going to happen at that baseball game. <clears throat> and so he goes and finds Terence, who has kind of gone into seclusion, who has faded out of public life, and who just wants to be left alone. And the encounter with Terence begins very badly, with Ray getting the door slammed in his face two or three times. But ultimately, after faking that he has a gun in his pocket, <laughs> He finally convinces Terence to come to the baseball game with him. And they're there at the baseball game, eating hot dogs, watching the game, and there's another voice. Go the distance. And suddenly, on the scoreboard, comes up Archibald Moonlight Graham. Played one game, one inning in one game. Got zero at bats. And somehow they know that they're supposed to go find this Archibald. It's a wonderful movie. You may remember it. It's full of mysterious things that happen. Of dreams that two people share, the same dream of strange coincidences that happen one upon the other. But it's not a movie about a baseball field and a corn pasture. It's a movie about dreams. It's about dreams coming to light. It's a movie about light. Because in this movie, several people's dreams come true. Shoeless Joe Jackson gets to play baseball again. He said that when he couldn't play baseball anymore, it felt like part of him had been amputated. So he was now reunited with that part. He and eight others and another teams that they finally brought in to play baseball so they could have complete games. They did find and hook up with Archibald Moonlight. And he got to play in with the big league. He said his dream had always been to be at bat in the big league and to feel the tingle in your hands and your arms when the bat connects with the ball. And he came out and he played on the field of dreams and got his hit playing in the big league with the professionals. There was Terrence Mann, who had been a writer and written tons of books, who had been very passionate, but that passion had faded away. He got tired of people looking for, to him for the answers, and so he went into reclusion. And here was this opportunity this passion came up again in this search that they were all leading on as to what all these voices meant. And when Shoeless Joe invites him, Terrence Mann, to go out of the field with them, to go out into the corn, he now has something to write about. His passion comes back. And on that game, when everyone has left, including Shoeless Joe, there's one more player on the field, a catcher taking off his gear. And as he turns around, Ray recognizes him. It's his father. The father that he had a fight with when he was a teenager and went off to Berkeley. And though he said he wanted to come home again, he couldn't figure out how. And his father passed away before he ever saw him again. 
But here he is on the field. And Ray has the opportunity to introduce his father to his daughter-in-law, Anne, and to his granddaughter, Cretina. Karen, excuse me, Karen. And he plays catch with his father again. And though it was probably a dream that Ray didn't realize he had, he had the opportunity to mend the fences, to mend the relationship that he had broken with his father. And his father had the dream come true of playing catch again with his son and seeing his granddaughter. Dreams coming true, coming to light. Very early in the movie, the first time that Shoeless Joe comes on the field after they've played, he asks Ray, is this heaven? And Ray goes, no, this is Iowa. <laughs> At the end of the movie, after he's met his father again and played catch with him, his father asks, is this heaven? And Ray gives the same answer. No, this is Iowa. But then he stops and he asks his father, is there heaven? And his father assures him, yes, there is. It's that place where your dreams come true. And Ray looks at his father, and he turns around and looks back at the farmhouse and the swing that his wife and his daughter are sitting on. And he looks at the field, and he goes, that's true, then maybe this is heaven. Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the scriptures today. We didn't read it because it gets quoted later in Matthew. But he says that those, well, he says that nevertheless, those who are in gloom will be there no longer. There'll be no more gloom for those in distress. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And the psalmist echoes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In Matthew, Jesus is fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy of the light coming of those being in darkness, seeing the light. And Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. In the movie, people were in pain. People were in gloom. People were in darkness. They were suffering, and their disease was all over missed dreams. But Ray heard the voice, build it, and he will come. And he built a field against all reason, built a field even though it might mean financial ruin. And his actions brought others' dreams to reality. His actions brought even dreams that he probably didn't know he had to truth. In the movie, Anne's brother is always trying to get Anne and Ray to sell the farm before it goes into foreclosure, and they lose all. 
Bray has lined up some investors that are willing to buy the farm from them before the bank forecloses. And they keep pressuring them, but throughout the movie they keep saying, no, we're not going to sell the farm. And finally it gets to the point where Ray and his investors buy the note from the bank just before they're going to foreclose. And they come, Ray comes to say that tomorrow morning I and my investors are going to foreclose if you don't sign these papers and sell the farm to us today. Now they're sitting on bleachers, right, by the baseball field. They're watching a baseball game going on. Anne is there, his wife, his daughter Karen, and Mr. Mann is there as well. And his brother, who has never been able to see the baseball players the whole game, walks right through the middle of the game up to the bleachers and is talking to them. And sitting up on that back bleacher, his daughter Karen, his young daughter Karen, says, Dad, you don't have to sell the farm. They will come. People will come to Iowa City and get bored and for reasons they don't know, they'll drive up here. They'll come because they'll be drawn to relive for some strange reason memories of their childhood. And Terrence Mann adds on, yes Ray, people will come. They will turn in your driveway for reasons they cannot fathom. They will be willing to pay to look around, for they have money. It's peace they lack. Christ brings the light, the light that banishes our gloom, our distress, our disease, our darkness. The light asks us to believe in it, to believe even when the light seems contrary to reason. And we are drawn to this light, though often we don't know the reasons why. We pull into Christ's driveway without any fathoming of why we're doing this. We get out and we look around, always being drawn closer and closer to the light. And in following that light, mystical things will happen. Our questions of who and why and what, though they may persist for a while, will suddenly be answered. The peace we are seeking will suddenly be there right in our laps. And we and others around us who are traveling along the way will have our dreams come true. As Ray's dad said, in our dreams coming true, the kingdom of heaven exists, regardless of whether it be Iowa or Montana. Amen. Oh,